I'm going to talk to you about uh, some matters that stem from 20 years, really, of looking at the brain and considering what might be different about the two hemispheres, a question that no self-respecting neuroscientist would ask himself. Um, and I'll come on to that. But I first want to start with just some little pointers in recent uh, weeks uh, that have astonished me. I was in Toronto giving a talk. After it ended, a woman came up to the microphone and said, I teach five to ten-year-olds, and my colleagues and I have noticed in the last few years that we now have to teach children how to read the human face. And that's quite extraordinary because it's at the basis of all, obviously, of all our understanding of ourselves and one another and of a society and a community and of just about everything um, that matters to us. But it's implicit knowledge, and it's knowledge that the right hemisphere, um, I think indisputably, uh, is the, uh, provides the locus for. But if you put that together with some emails I've had recently from teachers saying things like, and I have had several, saying things like, for a decade there was only one person I can remember who couldn't do a certain task. But now in the last three or four years, um, I've noticed that a, quite a considerable proportion, 25%, 30% of the class, can't do it. And that's to do with sustaining attention. And then there is research that suggests that children nowadays are less empathic, measurably so, than they used to be. Now, if you put all those three things together, they interest me, because if you had to characterize differences uh, between the left and right hemisphere, three things that stand out are the capacity to sustain attention, to provide the neural substrate for empathy, and to read faces. So it looks literally as though we are de-emphasizing or forgetting to uh, see what it is that our right hemispheres can offer to us. I'll, I'll explain a bit more of that. So how did I ever get on to that? I was um, a don at Oxford who studied literature and talked about that for a while. <laughs> and it seemed to me a rather unsatisfactory business. It seemed to me that art, and in particular literature, was really, its whole purpose was to move in exactly the opposite direction from the one in which, as a critic, I was uh, obliged to take it. Somebody had gone to great trouble to create something that was absolutely unique, was incarnate, it was embodied in the words that it was, and you couldn't paraphrase it and still have the same thing. Um, and this incarnate embodied object worked on me in an embodied way. If you read Wordsworth's syntax in the prelude, you actually can feel things happening in your frames, so your breathing to your pulse and so on. So it seemed to me that something embodied was acting on an embodied being, that something unique had been created, that if it hadn't been made, it could never have been thought of, much as if one of you, imagine one of your best friends, didn't exist. You couldn't imagine them. You can't put them together from bits that are in a cupboard somewhere out of which humanity is put together. They are, in that way, works of art are non-substitutable. They're not fungible. Isn't that a wonderful word? I love that word, fungible. Yeah. They're not fungible. Uh, they can't be substituted by anything else at all. And the whole process of criticizing makes this embodied, unique, Thing, full of all sorts of imperfections that are part of its excellence and part of why we love it, into something that is abstract and general and fails by certain general standards. I mean, I was intrigued by why the poems of, for example, Hardy, which, when you take them apart, seem rather clunky, actually, and full of imperfections. Yet, and the sentiments you could find anywhere, you know, how awful it is to lose somebody that you love. But if you actually read those poems, you've, you have an experience which can't be found anywhere else, and there'd be a hole in the universe if he hadn't written those poems. And they can change lives, but you'd never think of that when you looked at any way that you approached it. And I was talking with, I was lucky enough to have a sinological friend, Chinese specialist, uh, David Hawkes, alas, now dead. And I was talking to him about a book I was writing called Against Criticism, which was really trying to articulate philosophically what the problem was in the analytic mind meeting the work of art. 
And I said, the trouble is that our language doesn't have terms for what I want to say. Whenever I try to say it, language subverts what I'm trying to say. And he said, the Chinese would understand entirely what you're talking about. And he then put me in touch with certain things that made me think, it's not necessary to see the world this way. In other cultures, people manage to see it in a different way. Then I thought, well, this is really something to do with the mind-body problem. And I, I studied the philosophers on this. And I found that generally they were much too disembodied in their approach. And that really to understand it, I needed to do this in an embodied way. If I wanted to understand the mind-body relationship, I needed to train as a doctor and have the experience of working with people where things have gone wrong with their bodies and it, or brains and it affects their minds or vice versa. And so that's what I did. And I ended up in psychiatry because I'm interested in the interface between mind and body. And I got fascinated, I'm not going to tell you the long, tedious story of how it happened, but I got fascinated by the issue of the dividedness of the brain. I'm actually just going to move on to uh, that, that slide, which really should have been the first slide. It's really just to remind those of you who are not familiar with looking at brains. Here we're looking down on the top of the brain with the front at the top of the picture and the back at the bottom. And the right hemisphere has been pulled aside to show this band of tissues called the corpus callosum, which connects them. And what you notice is that this, this mass of tissues that exists only in connections, everything the brain does is simply by making connections, synaptic connections between neurons, has this whopping great divide down the middle. And that is a puzzle that I've never heard people address. And the puzzle is made more curious by the fact that over evolution the ratio of the size of the corpus callosum to the volume of the hemispheres has got smaller, not bigger. Evolution has done nothing to try and reverse this. It seems to be important for evolutionary reasons, and evolution doesn't do things for fun or by accident. Um, it seems to be important that something is being kept separate from something else. And that impression is reinforced when you realize that a preponderance of the traffic across the corpus callosum has an inhibitory nature. A lot of the fibers that cross it are actually excitatory fibers, but they then terminate on inhibitory into neurons, so that the overall effect is one of telling the other hemisphere, keep out of this, I'm dealing with this. Now, why would that be? People thought it was because we separated out functions. You know, and there was a story after the first split brain operations that one of the hemispheres did sort of reason and language and the other one did pictures and emotions and was sort of pink and fluffy and, 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 and generally creative, but sort of not reliable. And, and it, <laughs> this idea, of course, is bizarre and, and um, is entirely false. And so neuroscience gave up on it when it discovered that actually reason depends on both hemispheres, language depends massively on both hemispheres, and so does everything else. The left hemisphere isn't devoid of emotions. In fact, one of the emotions that is most classically lateralized to the left hemisphere is that of anger. Uh, and so it's not a reasonable organ at all compared with the right hemisphere. Um, and uh, we, uh, I, I'd love to talk to you a lot about that, but I'm going to try to focus today strictly on things that are important to the topic that we're looking at today. If we, if, one of the reasons why um, people gave up on this was that they saw, well, you know, they don't seem to do different things. And that, I think, was because they were asking the wrong question. They were asking the question uh, that you'd ask of a machine. What is it it does? You see, when you're... Our language isn't uh, equipped to talk about the brain. It didn't develop to talk about the brain. It developed to talk about everyday life. And in everyday life, we don't have the sort of set of terms or a whole scheme, if you like, that would apply to something quite as extraordinary as the brain, which is the point where consciousness and matter seem to meet. And so when you're talking about it, you have to, of course we have to, when we understand anything, we're comparing it with something else that we think we understand better. We're modeling it as a something. So, ah, I see, it's like that, I see. And there really are only two options. One is to talk about it as a machine. The other is to talk about it as part of a person. And whichever one you choose, you can be accused of distorting the picture. But I'm afraid there isn't an alternative. But the one that seems to me really to distort is the one that it's just a machine. It's rather a bizarre thing that nowadays when we explain anything, we resort to the model of the machine. In the past, when people wanted to understand something, they compared it to something organic, like a river or a tree or a family. They didn't compare it with a machine. 
But if you do, in fact, try asking different questions, what about this, what's it like, as you would about a person? What's, what's its preoccupations, its manner of doing things, its set of values? Then you find something very different coming up. And that is that one of the hemispheres seems to be devoted to a certain way of looking at the world and the other to a quite different one. And that's why I put that slide up. Really what it suggests, it's rather nice that it contains hands that are bringing things into being because that's part of the topic today. But it's also suggesting that there are some things to which there isn't a right royal road of certainty. You can't make one thing certain first and build on that because the premises on which you've built that are already up for grabs. This is very important when you think about attention. The way you attend to something changes what you find. And if you attend to the body in the way that a surgeon does, you see one thing. If you attend to the body in the way a sculptor does, you see another. If you attend to the body in the way that a lover does, you see a third. These are quite different realities. There isn't a real body that's separate from all of those. So partly attention is governed by what you think it is that you're looking at, so you bring the appropriate attention to bear, but partly the attention you bring to bear governs what it is you find, and thence there is this circle. So you have to be quite careful about how you approach this. You can't actually do it with certainty, you have to do it by intuition. Now this is relevant because the difference between those two hemispheres turns out to be largely about attention. And I think it has a clear evolutionary basis. We're not the only ones to have divided brains. Birds and animals and actually fish also have divided brains. And one of the reasons is that they need to do two things which are very difficult to do at the same time with their consciousness, with their ability to interact with the, with the environment. They need to be able to focus down on a detail because they need to be able to have certain clear, sharp vision of something small that they need, usually food, prey, or a twig to build a nest, or whatever it might be. So utility is the goal. Manipulation of the environment is the aim here. And it's served by a narrow beam kind of attention. But if they're only able to do that, they won't survive. While they're getting their lunch, they'll become somebody else's, because they need to have the precisely opposite attention at exactly the same time, an uncommitted, open attention for whatever it is that might be whether that be a predator or a mate. And it turns out that in animals and birds, and there's a huge literature on this because the animal ethologists went frightened off the topic by things like the Volvo ad, a car for your right brain, made it all seem so tacky that the, <laughs> the human neuroscientists just went, oh dear, and gave up. So uh, bird and animal ethologists have a, a vast array of data, which is fascinating, which shows that birds and animals tend to use their right hemisphere for uh, this broad, vigilant, open attention uh, for predators and bonding with their mates, and their left hemisphere for um, selecting detailed things in the environment that they want to use. Now, the con the con what happens because of this is that they develop two different ways of looking at the world. I mean, I hope you can see, perhaps, that from what I've said about how attention changes the world, if you have these two entirely different kinds of attention, you're going to construe the world in two entirely different ways. One is made up of tiny, separate, static bits that have to be put together in order to perceive anything at all. The other is one in which you see the whole, and you understand that much as you need to understand parts to see a whole, you need to understand the whole in which those parts inhere before you can understand what the parts are. It's a hermeneutic circle like the Escher's hand suggests. One generalizes and says, oh, it's one of those. It's because its aim is utility. It's not particularly interested in the detail of what's going on, actually, although it has detailed vision, because it's representing a useful version of the world, useful for interacting with it and manipulating it with it. In other words, it provides a map. It provides a map of the world, a representation, literally not present anymore, but re presented after the fact as a set of concepts that are already familiar. American neuroscientist uh, Elkin and Goldberg, very famous man, uh, spent a long time looking at this and concluded that all new experience, and it's, 
new experience of anything, of a new skill, of a new person, of a new idea, of a new word, it doesn't really matter, is first best appreciated in the right hemisphere and then becomes coded in the left hemisphere as it becomes familiar, as it, in other words, is no longer present but represented. And you can actually see that on neuroimaging. So one is devoted to the idea of generalities and abstractions, a map. If I'm going from here to Edinburgh, I don't really need to know about all the families in the houses on the route and how they treat their dogs and what their children are called and what they have for supper. <coughs> it's true that all that is going on, but I need to be highly selective. And the left hemisphere aims to produce that less is more picture, which is a very simplified version of the world, has the same sort of reality that a map has in relation to the land that it maps. The other is constantly looking out for the thing as it freshly is, before it is, as it were, put in a pigeonhole and said, it's one of those. So it appreciates the freshness, the uniqueness, the embodiedness before aspects of it have been taken out of context. It contextually sees. It sees the thing within its whole context and sees that everything therefore relates to something else and has its existence in relation to other things. Modern physics has taught us that the world is not um, a, a set of atoms that collide like billiard balls. In fact, the harder you look at it, the more you see that it is very uncertain. It is arrangements of probabili probabilistic connections that span very large spaces. In fact, there's entanglement of particles at opposite ends of the universe. So things are not either unconnected or static uh, or particulate. But the left hemisphere's attention breaks them down as if they were. And that's a quick and dirty fix on life that enables us to manipulate the world usefully. Newtonian mechanics works because it's talking about a special set of circumstances at equilibrium, which the world rarely is. This is how we got into the financial uh, crisis, we thought we had marvellous uh, algorithms about how the world works, which would work in a static situation. But as soon as you put human beings with all their multifarious, um, unpredictable qualities into it, that system soon breaks down and the unpredictable occurs. Something quite as simple as the, the double pendulum uh, illustrates this. A pendulum has a perfectly predictable movement. But if you suspend another pendulum from the bottom of the pendulum and set them both swinging, they now have a chaotic set of movements that are very hard, if at all possible, to predict. And the real world is more like the double pendulum than the pendulum, because things are feeding back onto one another and changing them all the time. So the left hemisphere has this take on the world, which is also that of a map which, or a screen, a surface on which things are displayed from which it feels somewhat detached. You see, we need to stand back from the world. Our frontal lobes, which are massively developed in human beings, and actually also in the great apes, almost as large in the great apes. The difference between ours and theirs is not so much the size, but the fact that there's more white matter in ours, which is very important. White matter is white because of the neuronal sheath of myelin, which speeds up transmission between areas, and it's all about interconnectivity, which our brains are better at than and great apes. But the frontal lobes are hugely um, enlarged in human beings. And I, you know, there's a lot to say about frontal lobes, but if I wanted to give you one message about the frontal lobes, what do they do? They enable you to stand back from reality in time and space. They give you distance. And by gi giving you distance, you see more and you see forward and backwards in time. You're not trapped in that moment. So you don't just in a reflex way, react by hitting somebody when they offend you, you think, look, actually, I can see why he did that, and he could be a friend of mine, and so it's better I don't do that now. So it's able to plan, it's able to see how other people think, it's able to do all these things largely through standing back. Now, one of the problems is that in neuroscience, that standing back is always seen as detached and in the service of manipulation, which is certainly what the left hemisphere stands back from the world in order better to do, to deceive, to manipulate. But the right hemi hemisphere also stands back from the world with its enlarged frontal lobe. And funnily enough, the right frontal lobe is bigger than the left, and it's the most recently expanded area of the human cortex. 
And what does that area of the brain do? It's fundamental to our social being, to our sense of ourselves as individuals who are connected to other individuals. We're separate but together. This business about union and division being required together is very important. And it gives empathy. And when we stand back from the world, we can for the first time see others as like ourselves. And that forms bonds and connects. It's a bit like in the great eras of culture where I think we've been able to do this best. Drama has come to the fore. It did in 6th century BC Athens. It did again in the Renaissance, Shakespeare. And in drama, we stand back from ourselves a certain distance. But in doing so, we are not alienated. That enables us to connect more with ourselves, pity for human condition, and empathize and sympathize with others. So this distance doesn't render a detached flatness, but in the right hemisphere, a sense of depth in which things are connected. So the left hemisphere tends to flatten space, the right hemisphere tends to deepen it. And interestingly, the correlate of that in music is a single line as a flatness, and harmony as giving depth. I'll come back to that point. Now, because there are these two ways of looking at the world, they produce two different kinds of knowledge. And in most languages other than English, there are two words for the word to know. In French, there's connaître, the way you know people. Savoir, the way you know facts. And in German, it's kennen versus wissen. And I'd be interested to know if there's such a distinction in Norwegian, is there? Thank you very much. So... It's an oddity of our language, we don't have this distinction. But in fact, they represent two entirely different ways of thinking about the world. And we can't really apply one to the other unless we are going to get a very reduced version. Certainly if you apply the kind of knowledge of facts to human beings or to works of art, which I'm going to suggest should be viewed more like human beings than like things. In fact, Aristotle said that that art is organic and is like a living being. It has those qualities that can't be reduced, that you can't really substitute anything for a person, you can't for the work of art. As a person is embodied, not just a set of abstract qualities, so is a work of art. As a work of art needs to express itself implicitly, so do people. So works of art are like people, not like things or ideas. And they need to keep this tension between the abstract and the concrete in which we live the mental and the physical, the spiritual and the embodied, they need to be kept together as they are in, uh, in human beings and in great works of art. Now, I think that has begun to disintegrate in the last hundred years and is a problem for us. We must maintain this tension, which the right hemisphere is happy with. The right hemisphere understands that opposites often cohere because the left hemisphere thinks that they cancel one another out. One way of thinking about it is the left hemisphere is always trying to close down to a certainty. It's either this or it's that. It's black or white. Because, in fact, if you want to interact with the world, you've got to get that prey, you've got to build that house. You need that. It's no good sort of standing back in a philosophical sort of thing. Well, it could and it might not. And it, it, you've got to be cut and dried. But that doesn't... It, it's a good guide for interacting with the world and manipulating, but, it, but it's not a good guide for understanding what there really is there. Now, just as there are two kinds of knowledge, there are two kinds of skill. There's a kind of skill which nowadays we think you can get from learning things in books and following procedures on paper. I'm a doctor. In the old days, it used to be thought that the most valuable thing a doctor had was experience. And indeed, my experience has taught me that many of the things that I learned theoretically are not really right. They have a sort of general applicability, but fortunately, no single person that I ever meet is a general abstraction. They're all unique. They're all embodied. They're all different. So when I get a helpful um, missive from a uh, nice a body of people sitting uh, somewhere a few hundred yards north of where we are now, um, telling me how to treat a depressed patient, I'm a bit sceptical, because who is this depressed patient? I have never met him. I've just met lots of suffering people, all of whom require an entirely different approach. So there is that idea of skill, but there's another that is the implicit embodied skill that you learn from experience, which is nuanced, which is quite often intuitive. 
And I hope you may know a book by the Dreyfuses called What Machines Can't Do. They wrote this in the 1980s. It's a marvelous book. And um, because people said, oh, well, technology moves on, um, <coughs> 20 years later they wrote a book called What Machines Still Can't Do. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> the essence of what they're saying is there are certain kinds of skill, and they distinguish five levels. And you can get as far as three by following algorithms. But for four and five, which are really the higher levels of skill that we expect of an expert, they can't be taught in this way. They have to be part of an embodied experience that is learnt in the body, not through following algorithms in the mind. And often these things need to be accessed very rapidly. A surgeon hasn't got time to work through an algorithm. He's got to react immediately and his instincts have got to be good. And they will be better if he's been trained well intellectually, but also if he's got lots of experience. There's a bit of a mix-up about intuition, you see. Intuition isn't just any old random idea that comes along with some emotive flavor. Reason and emotion and intuition are intertwined. The intuitions of somebody who has reasoned well all their life will be better than the intuitions of somebody who hasn't. But equally, the reasoning of somebody who intuits well and is experienced will be a lot better than the reasoning of somebody who hasn't got that to rely on. Reason can lead us astray, just as intuition can by over-rationalizing and reducing, because it's the left hemisphere's take to rationalize. Reason is a product of the two, the bringing together of skill, judgment, and the ability to ratiocinate together. Now, it strikes me as odd that if, you know, um, people are highly trained in these skills to become, say, a, a pilot or to become a, a surgeon, that artists are no longer thought to need to be trained in this way. Um, they used to have to learn things technically, but then go into workshops and learn embodied skills from people who've been doing it for a long time. But now, apparently, you can be a bright young thing and come out of a school with very little experience and a few ideas, and suppose that your theory represents an art object. But a theory is not an art object. And the things that artists do are more important than flying planes. They're more important even than what surgeons do. People's lives depend on those, it's true. But what artists do, on that depends a civilization. It's no good staying alive and having good transport and good financial services if we don't know what the meaning of life is. We haven't any idea why we're here or what we're doing. Increasingly, we don't. Because the things that used to lead us to that world, the world of the right hemisphere, which sees things broadly, intuitively, implicitly, where meaning resides, has been usurped, and we start looking for it in the way that we look for scientific meaning. If you think I'm misusing the word meaning, I'm using it in a way we use every day. Think of this. That person means so much to me. What does she mean? I can't tell you what she means. What do you want? A statement? Of course not. But she means a lot. A piece of music. Schubert's C major quintet. Very few things in this world mean more to me than that. But what is it? It's a set of notes. A single note doesn't mean anything. If you put two notes that don't mean anything together, you still haven't got anything. What else have you got? Lots of relationships and gaps. So is it in the silence? No. Silence doesn't give meaning either. It's in the whole thing together. The gaps, the notes, and the whole. Now that's what we need to get back to understanding. But there is a problem with this. Because intuition, inspiration, are things that require hard work and can't be willed, and you may never have them. And we don't like that. Because we live in an era of democracy. Everybody must be able to be good at it, so it must be something I can insert into you, and then you'll be a very good artist. A genius, perhaps. We derogate this idea of genius, because we don't like the idea that some people just may be more gifted than others. But I think we're deluding ourselves. It's not to say that it's just a matter of inspiration. It's a matter of doing some hard work as well. Wordsworth illustrates this beautifully. He talks about this in the prelude, where he says really that I'm paraphrasing, obviously, that when one wants to write, one has to put oneself in the position to receive something, but it won't come. One has to think and work towards the creative thing that you want to achieve, but it won't happen. It's when you go away that it comes to you and it works. But it wouldn't come to you if you hadn't done the other thing first. So often you have to do something knowing that it's going to be no good. You have to batter away at it. 
But without battering away at it, when you switch off, it won't happen. There is that difficult relationship. But because this is an unpredictable process, in an era where art is commodified, and it's important to produce the stuff rather like you could produce it off a, a line so that your investors and so on get a return on their investment, um, you need to be able to churn the stuff out. And hence conceptual art. You know, it's terribly easy. I mean, I've thought of so many wonderful conceptual pieces in the past, and uh, unfortunately I never had the idea of approaching somebody who was an agent in the West End. But you know, this is not any good. If you have to explain a work of art by telling you this is what it means, it doesn't mean anything. Because it, the meaning of a work of art is never going to be that kind of meaning. It's got to be embodied, it's got to be implicit, it's got to be intuitive. And that doesn't mean that any old thing that doesn't seem to mean anything will have meaning, I'm afraid. That's no shortcut either. It has, the test is on the heart. The test is when you see that, whether it, you think, my God, this thing is amazing. It's telling me something, I don't know what, but it's very powerful. And, and also, it mustn't be a raw shark plot. You know, there's a terrible tendency to bail, bail out works of art by us all going and saying, yeah, mm, I see, yeah. You read all your own stuff into it, but it's got to come halfway to meet you. Um, this is a conversation. It's not a one-way process. So art has got to have something there. We don't just put it in. On the other hand, when we go to meet it, we're giving a lot of ourselves to it. And I would like to say that meaning in art, therefore, is like the meaning in a person or in music, and that certain kinds of attempts to create an art that reflects the discordant, fragmented nature of our world won't work. Of course, art is in a fix. Art always reflects, and I'm afraid embodies, whether it likes it or not, a lot of the aspects of the civilization it comes out of. If our civilization is drifting more and more into a world which prizes the fragmented, the abstracted, the decontextualized. I'm afraid a lot of art is going to be like that. But I'm afraid a work of art will never work if it's like that, because a work of art depends on being a whole, on being able to have its effect through relationship of parts. And discordant music, you know, there's a certain degree of discord that is a very important part of the tension with concords. Bach is full of discord, but music that is only discordant, the human nervous system is simply not adapted to make much sense of it. It's all interpreted as angst. Uh, discords produce uh, an aversive reaction in animals, in birds, in humans as well. But tiny changes in harmony can absolutely alter the meaning of something and suddenly bring tears to the eyes. So something very powerful happens within the harmonic range that isn't the same in discord. And the sense of proportion in art is the same everywhere in the world, roughly speaking. You know, there's a sort of thing, oh, it's all culturally determined. Well, it isn't all culturally determined. We don't find the arts of other cultures repugnant. We approach Japanese art, we may not be equipped to understand it all, but actually we think staggeringly beautiful. We, we listen, there's a rather nice piece of research done in Norway uh, on uh, asking Norwegians to listen to Indian music, untrained. And they reported their feelings about the music. And when compared with what Indians said about it, they, were, they had picked up exactly what the Indians were picking up from it, even though they had no training. So it isn't just a culturally determined thing. We can't make anything into art. There is such a thing as beauty. We need to remember that and we need to respect it. Now, the modern world, I would say, is characterized, I haven't got time to go into why, I'm afraid it's very unsatisfactory that you don't have any evidence here, but I did write a long book. <laughs> I did write a long book, 600 pages, with 2,500 references. The bibliography is on my website. You can look at it at peace and work out why I'm saying all these things. I'm afraid I can only report results today, not all the argument, or we'd be here for a week. But the world that we look at today has certain features that suggest that we use, not that our brains are necessarily modified structurally in recent times. I'm not suggesting that if you really scan the brain now and scan the brain in the Renaissance, you see anything terribly different. But I think we've sort of moved towards one take. We prioritize only one take on the world. And actually, some rather nice research in the last uh, 20 years has shown that if you compare Far Easterners with Westerners, they actually perceive things differently, they approach problems differently, they resolve things differently. And if you had to characterize these in terms of the hemispheres, it's not the old thing that the West is left and the right, East is right. It's more that the Far East are able to use techniques of, and approaches of either hemisphere equally and appropriately where necessary. Whereas we use only the approach of the left hemisphere, which is the reductive, um, scientific one. 
I'm not, I have no argument against true science. I have an argument against a very naive and simple philosophy that really doesn't stand up, which suggests that this kind of thinking can explain everything. So the features I would point to in the modern world are a degree of fragmentation, which you would expect if you've got this narrow focus attention, a loss of the broader picture, the represented becoming more important than the, that what is present in front of us, a sort of simultaneous divorce of that mind-body relationship into things that are over-abstract and over-reified, mere matter and mere theory. A lack of the sense of depth in space, I'm going to just show you some pictures to finish with, um, and distorted and bizarre perspectives, which I think this perspective on the world is actually given by the right hemisphere. The loss of harmony and melody in music, which are also underwritten by the right hemisphere. Only rhythm is properly appreciated in the left hemisphere, and it's only rhythm now that seems to be present to my ear in much of the music that's being made at the most popular music anyway. And a sort of ironizing of ideas like beauty and awe and the idea of having a spiritual element to existence, whatever we mean by that, is ruled out by this ironizing, because the left hemisphere doesn't really understand these things. Here are some thing, images to take away with you, because I think it helps to use images. These were some studies done with patients with one hemisphere isolated at a time. And here we see a tree represented on the left by the whole brain. In the middle you see a very shrunken thing compared with a real tree. It's a symbolic tree. And interestingly, it's only on the right side. I mean, it, that is a curiosity that the left hemisphere tends to focus on the bit of space that's useful to it, the right side, whereas the right hemisphere gives both. So after a stroke involving the right hemisphere, only the left hemisphere is working, people will often ignore everything on the left side of space and attend only to things on the right. They'll only see the, that half of a page or people standing over there. Not because they're blind, this is an attentional problem. And sometimes they even forget to shave or dress the left half of the body. Um, but if you see on the right, you see the whole of the tree has been preserved. That is a sort of living, flowing tree. Here you see the same thing with flowers. Notice the symbolic nature of a flower. It's reduced to a regular, geometric, abstracted symbol of a flower compared with the more living thing on the right. Here I want to just draw your attention to the sense of depth, which is better in the right-hand column, which is because the right hemisphere sees depth in space and perspective better than the left. And here, these are all by the left hemisphere. A cube that you see has lost its uh, depth, tables there flattened out, but see what's happened to a tree and above all a person um, uh, here reduced to these uh, regular geometric symbolic forms. And this is rather nice, this is taken from, uh, the phantom drill is getting going now I see, uh, it's probably a hint, uh, the, the, uh, when Gazaniga was involved with split brain patients, this was testing a patient before and after the split brain operation. Before the operation, both the left and right hands can draw a passable cube in three dimensions. But after the operation, can you notice that only the left hand that's not used to it is still able to do a three-dimensional cube of sort? The right hemisphere, that's the right hand that has been drawing cubes all its life, can no longer do so because depth in space is no longer available to it. Um, these, this is a medieval representation of the world. And there are various things about it. The perspective is completely distorted. There was no sense of... Uh, the, 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 that came 100 to 150 years after this. But also notice that it paints a theory. It depicts knowledge of what the world is, not what we see. So for example, oh, sorry. So for example, this chap, the bishop, is important, so he's very large. Whereas this poor chap down here, buggering off to get a burger, he's small. And he's not considered important, so he's depicted smaller, because we know bishops are more important. But when you move on 150 years, you get this amazing depth in space and time, which engages us with these people who are set in a setting. You know, the uh, old 2,000-year-old sarcophagus, but it's still the present because these shepherds are dressed in contemporary Florentine costume. This is a, um, an adoration by Gil and Dio. But our eye is drawn off into successive planes of depth. Here again, really, you can't see it because of the lights, I'm afraid, but this fabulous uh, painting, uh, Claude's last painting in the Ashmolean in Oxford, uh, I was going to show you, but it's completely washed out, um, the, the layers of depth. There's about five levels of depth in this, and also the depth in time, where um, we see 
this already ancient piece of sculpture which has millennia of wear on it. So we're born into a context here. The picture is not about anything really, it's about the way in which colour and light draws into communion with the world and a context. And in the 20th century, as harmony disappeared in music, it came with the Renaissance, disappeared with the 20th century. Perspective was deliberately disrupted in the 20th century by extremely skilled artists like Picasso who knew perfectly well how to do it. <laughs> and we lost the depth of space and lost the sense of proportion here of the body. Um, one can like this or dislike it, but it's a fact that it represents... Uh, we really go through areas of modernism in the book and demonstrate that they all represent neurological uh, deficits that a neurologist is familiar with, ways of looking at the world which happen when bits of the right hemisphere are damaged. Um, and eventually you see the world as only a representation on the surface with nothing behind. So that, I believe, uh, is probably quite enough to say to you at the moment. But I would just like to say you are the guardians of meaning as artists, and it's far more important what you do than what people in the city do and so on. We've got it back to front. Arts are not a sort of icing on the cake. They are the core of our civilization. They're the core of our understanding of ourselves and of who we are. So stick with it in your spirit, in your body. Don't get drawn off into abstraction um, and uh, dereliction. Thank you. Thank you.